today. Uh, we got a wonderful talk. Uh, it's, uh, I'm going to read the title. You can read it with us. Uh, the Great Eight Minds and Human Evolution, Understanding Our Closest Living Relatives, the Chimpanzees and Bonobos. Uh, we, got the, we have tonight the great pleasure to have Dr. Sana Clay. Uh, she is uh, an assistant professor in the Department of Psychology at Durham University. Uh, she is a primatologist and developmental uh, psychologist inter interested in the evolution and development of the empathy, language, and culture through studying great apes and human children. Uh, she is a leading specialist in the great ape behavior and communication and conducts her research in both the wild and in captivity with bonobos and chimpanzees. Uh, this talk today, tonight will explore some of these similarities and differences and consider how this can contribute to a more balanced model of human evolution. So welcome to Dr. Uh, Clay. Um, is this, is this, it's on okay, yeah. Great. Um, well, thank you so much um, for this wonderful invitation to come to the Linnaean Society of London. It's truly a pleasure to be here and to be among such eminent uh, audience members as, as Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace in the audience. It's uh, quite an honour and to have such a wonderful audience. So thank you very much for, for being here and um, for, in advance for your interest in great apes. Uh, this is something we want to promote more. Um, particularly with the conservation status that we have now with our closest living relatives. So tonight I will be sort of walking you through um, sort of my, my insights and sort of some, some of the, the messages that we can gather from studying great apes and what that can tell us about um, the sort of basis of the, of the ways we behave today and how we might have evolved as a species. So um, this evening I'll be sort of primarily focusing, it's quite a broad talk, about uh, primarily our two closest living relatives, the chimpanzees and bonobos, but I will be giving you some, uh, walk you through some other aspects of, of primate behaviour, and I hope that I can sort of uh, convince you that actually many of the things we consider unique and special about our, our, our behaviour as a human, as a, as, a, uh, as a homo sapien, is actually got a very deep evolutionary history, in, and we can find that through studying our closest living relatives, uh, the, the non-human primates. So, um, sort of, I find as a, as a, as a primatologist and, a, and a, what I call a comparative psychologist, um, studying non-human primates can give us many, many insights into interesting phenomena um, in terms of cognition behavior and, and many other areas. But for me, one of the reasons that I'm interested in studying great apes is because they can provide us this window into what we could have looked like before we were, before we were modern humans. So um, looking back through the hominid lineage, we can actually trace the, the, the basal roots of, of, our, of our unique skill set that we find in modern humans today. Because actually we don't have an, an existing version of ourselves in the past. So great apes give us that special window into underlying processes, which is one of my motivations to study such fascinating species. So um, I always like to kind of to start off my, my talks, both to scientists and non-scientists, with sort of reminding us all where we are in the evolutionary tree. Um, so up here you can see um, the great ape family tree, the hominids, uh, which actually uh, what we often forget that we are one of five great ape species. Uh, we are a human ape. The rest of them are non-human apes. So to me, it, it really makes perfect sense to think of us in this context. Um, and so I'll sort of give you a, a brief introduction of each of the, the great ape species um, on, this, on this map. But this basically can show you the kind of e uh, the approximate evolutionary divergence of each of the five great ape species we, we have living today. Incidentally, I was actually at a bonobo meeting yesterday in Belgium, and we were talking about a third ghost species uh, between chimpanzees and bonobos, which they're starting to detect in the ancient uh, DNA of current living bonobos, which is interesting 
interesting. So maybe in 10 years, we'll actually find there's, a, there's, a, there's another species that we, um, we've missed um, so far in modern science. So uh, orangutans are actually the uh, most distant related to us of the great apes. There's been lots about them actually recently in the Iceland uh, advert controversy. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but um, Iceland are really doing their part to actually ban palm oil in their products, which is actually completely destroying the habitat of orangutans. And this advert's actually been banned because apparently talking about conservation is a political uh, agenda, which, uh, again, it's a controversial, but I encourage you to watch the advert if you haven't yet. Um, and from orangutans, we actually, so around 12 to 16 million years ago, they diverged from our lineage, or the lineage which we've now become. And then around 6 to 10 million years ago, we have the gorillas who split off to become gorillas. And then actually, as recently as 5 to 7 million years ago, I do say that because evolutionarily that is quite a recent phenomenon, um, we actually split from what we call the chimpanzee and bonobo ancestor, which at that point was as probably a single species. Um, and actually, we went off to become human, and then they split subsequently into two separate species, chimpanzees and bonobos, who only one to two million years ago became two separate species, which is actually really recent. And to me, fascinating because we've seen many differences between these two species, despite a relatively recent divergence. So one of our key questions is why that divergence happened, and we're kind of untacking the genetic base of, of it right now. Um, but to me, one of the motivators for studying chimpanzees and bonobos is because it gives us this capacity to kind of actually triangulate, to make an estimate of what this, this relative of ours, this ancestor that we share with bonobos and chimpanzees, might have looked like before it went into the human line. And we have uh, our, our example of a human there, uh, Carl Linnaeus, um, whose who's, um, wonderful society we're, we're sitting in right now. So um, just to sort of walk you through briefly as a tour of the approximate sort of tour of eight great apes, uh, just for those that um, are less uh, sort of familiar with them. So the orangutan, the more distant related um, relative of ours, is actually three recognized species now. Um, I'm not sure if any of you caught the news last year, but there's actually been a, a discovery of a third. Uh, there's the, Borne the Bornean and Sumatran orangutans, but there's now the Tapanuli orangutan that's been discovered uh, to, to actually in a, in a specific area of Indonesia, which in Tapanuli, and, and, and they've basically found that it, it suggests that there may be a third species orangutan. It's already basically extinct. So um, we're, this is one of the reasons why it's important for us to have these conversations now, to kind of stimulate more interest and mo hopefully motivate people to actually um, do, you know, do their part in protecting these fascinating species. Um, now, the orangutan is highly intelligent. They're also expert tool users. They're really a cognitively advanced uh, great ape species. Um, interestingly, they're probably the least social of the great apes. Um, they tend to be semi-solitary. We're not actually sure if that's their ancestral state or their modern state as a, as a sort of as a result of various uh, sort of human infringement on their habitat. Um, but they are, they're an interesting species because they're actually rather different to the highly social nature of chimpanzees and bonobos. Um, so uh, the orangutans, that's the orangutans. And then the next species of uh, great ape that I sort of wanted to walk through is the gorilla. Again, the gorilla is actually two species of gorilla. We now, we've identified of which there are two subspecies. So the gorilla and orangutan aren't really one animal. They're multiple different species. Um, the gorilla is probably one of the sort of apes that you're perhaps most familiar with, things, things like Planet of the Apes and so on. Um, and so we've got these, again, these are highly endangered great apes. Um, the eastern lowland, particularly the mountain gorillas, um, have, have gone, undergone a huge amount of population decline as a result of encroachment on habitats and so on from humans. Uh, the Cross River Gorilla is almost extinct now. Uh, the Western Lowland is sort of doing probably the best of the four, but these are really, really vulnerable uh, species of apes here. Um, the Cross River is interesting because they live in a very hilly part of sort of uh, Western and Central Africa where essentially they've managed to survive a bit longer than the rest because they live in such mountainous, difficult territory for people to sort of um, hunt them. Um, 
But interestingly, with the gorilla, despite their colossal size and, and sort of this, you know, this, this, this reputation for being quite aggressive and King Kong, they're actually the gentle giants of the great ape world. And um, these are the vegetarians that eat uh, essentially a vegetation all day. Um, they're not as aggressive as people think. In fact, the, um, the, the alpha, the the silverback male spends most of his time trying to protect a group of females who actually are very peaceful a lot of the time. It's just these occasional invasions from other males that he needs to protect them. They're intriguing because uh, you, they actually have a rather different uh, social system than um, I think most typical uh, human societies and also uh, chimpanzees and bonobos in that you have one single male generally and then a harem of females. But uh, bizarrely, those females are actually very unsocial with each other. So they basically spend time together, but they're not really socializing. Uh, the male has to do a lot of work to kind of keep his, his females together, who basically don't, they don't really groom each other. Um, there is an interesting uh, sort of dynamic in gorilla society. Uh, you get a lot of youngsters playing, but the females, uh, they, they sort of orient with the males. So it's, uh, it's quite an interesting um, comparison to what we find in chimpanzees and bonobos. So uh, that's the gorilla and the orangutan. And then the chimpanzee is probably the, possibly the one you're most familiar with. Uh, you've probably seen them in lots of different settings and zoos, probably, I imagine. Um, we now actually know that there are four subspecies of chimpanzees. Um, and actually, we find distinct differences in some of their behavior, which I will touch on briefly tonight. Um, so they're really a very, very intelligent species. Um, they seem to sort of knock out, you know, they, they outcompete other animals in terms of their cognitive and physical cognitive abilities. Um, they live in very complex societies, very rich social relationships, and they have what's called a fission fusion society. So that's actually what we have as humans uh, in the sense that we have, uh, we've, we fission and we fuse. So we have large communities which we're not with all of the time. So we spend, so chimpanzees live in the, a community community of around 80, but they'll rarely be all together. So they'll come together for periods of the day or the month when there's enough foraging opportunity, and then they'll split into smaller parties. So they're always breaking up and going back together. So if you imagine sort of at a family, say at a family wedding, you'll have groups of individuals that will all come together for the ceremony, but then you'll all split off into little groups and, and maybe forage or go off and some will dance. Uh, you'll have this continual change in social structure. And this is actually really cognitively demanding um, socially. So we think that fission fusion societies actually have promoted the sort of evolution of more complex social cognition. Um, they're also, they're, they're very smart socially and also physically. And uh, as a result, we, they're, they're really some of the best tool users on the planet, except for humans. They use very complex tools uh, throughout uh, their, their home ranges. Um, now, oh, I didn't also mention, oh yes, I did. So I'm gonna mention the next uh, sort of set, uh, set of uh, slides a little bit more about chimpanzees. Um, so interestingly for chimps, um, so they are what we, you, what we would call a male bonded society. So this is sort of, uh, as, uh, although it's tricky to make analogies, I would sort of say they are like the kind of mafia of the uh, sort of the great ape world. You've got this sort of godfather, this alpha male. I don't know if any of you saw Dynasty, uh, the David Attenborough, which has just been put on. But this shows this really this sort of male-centric society that we find in chimpanzees, um, where you have a very strong alpha male and his, his close allies. It's very political. There's a lot of power wielding. There can be quite a lot of aggression. Um, but there's a lot of social bonding as well and a lot of cooperation, so they work very, very well together. Um, the males are highly dominant in chimpanzee society, and a lot of people have taken that as a view that we have come from a sort of male-centric model of human, human societal evolution. And I think it's quite convenient for some people to say that this is our, you know, historical uh, sort of background. But actually, hopefully tonight you'll get a slightly different picture, um, which, which I think is supported also through uh, genetic evidence too. So they're a male-dominant species, they're male-bonded, um, and they have very strong bonds within their groups, so they're very close with each other. But with that comes what we call a strong xenophobia or a very strong hostility towards outgroup members. So um, they have very hostile relationships with other communities. Uh, these can be very, um, they can be very aggressive. They can uh, um, sort of uh, impose war on other on other uh, communities, and they can be into community killing. 
incidentally, there um, they are. They they do. There's been a big sort of. There was a wide study um, done by Mike Wilson, a colleague of mine, which basically found that chimpanzees across the across the populations of all subspecies, they do commit intercommunity killings quite regularly, and they also do um, sometimes murder the offspring of other males. Sometimes even females will will actually commit murder of other females' uh, offspring. Um, we think as a as a competition in, in times of sort of foraging scarcity. Um, so they do have this component of violence. However, it mustn't be overestimated that they are also a wonderfully friendly, very nice species that really invest in their social relationships. Um, and so I will sort of uh, give you some evidence of that later. They've got this just interesting uh, sort of dynamic between the two. I think in some ways, as humans do, we have this capacity for both aggression and a lot of social tolerance and friendliness. Um, they're very good at cooperating, and this extends to hunting. So they're expert hunters. We think that they cooperate collaboratively to hunt, uh, and they go on patrols. So they, board, they, they, they go on silent marches around their territory, uh, which they coordinate with each other to basically check um, for intruders in their society uh, boundaries. Uh, they can be quite aggressive um, compared to bonobos, which is the next um, of the four that I'm going to present to you. Um, so the chimpanzees, uh, just so you can get a kind of idea, these are the, the yellow, green, purple and blue are the actual distribution of chimpanzees across Africa. So you've got the western chimpanzees to the sort of we uh, west, obviously, and then Nigeria and Cameroon, these are almost extinct actually, it's very, very sad. Um, and actually uh, we've got the eastern chimpanzees which are sort of become famous for Jane Goodall's research. Uh, and then we have the central chimpanzees um, below that, uh, and the so the the um, the dynasty um, the TV series that was on um, on uh, last week. They're, they're chimpanzees from Senegal, so they're over on this side in the west, um, and so. They're all distributed in 21 countries, actually, across Africa, so they have expanded quite far. Um, and what you can interestingly see in red, there's another species over there. And actually, what we're looking at here is not chimpanzees, but actually the bonobo. So the bonobos are actually fitting within, a sort of they look like they fit within the range of chimpanzees, but what you can't see on this map is a very large river, uh, which has blocked the chimpanzees and the bonobos from one another, um, which I'll show you in the next slide. So bonobos, although they look very like chimpanzees, are actually a very much a distinct species. Uh, they were only really discovered in 1930 um, when they were looking at museum specimens. Um, and they realized that morphologically they did look very different to chimpanzees. Uh, they tend to physically, they look like a sort of small, gracile version of a chimpanzee. Uh, they have many what we call pedomorphic traits. So bonobos show... Um, they, they, they show uh, more, in many different aspects, they actually show quite juvenilized traits, uh, which I will partly talk about today, um, including um, they, they physically, they're smaller, they have higher pitched voices, they're friendlier, um, they have pink lips, they have actually a, a distinct white tail tuft, which chimps lose when they're growing up, whereas bonobos retain theirs. Um, they have all sorts of aspects of the behavior which seem to be somehow juvenilized, and it's been suggested that they may have gone through a process of self-domestication. So this is the idea that basically um, aggression has been bred out of them through selection against aggression, uh, which um, you'll have, we perhaps can talk about later. Humans, incidentally, have also been proposed to go through a similar process of self-domestication. Uh, the sort of social tolerance that we find in human species, in the, human, in the Homo sapiens, suggests to us that we may have also gone through a similar selection against aggression in our own, in our own evolution. So bonobos are found in the Democratic Republic of Congo here. You can see the range. Above them is chimpanzees. To the east of them is chimpanzees. And actually, underneath here, we don't, uh, we don't exactly know where the range stops. But the Congo River is a very giant river, uh, this here. Uh, we, interestingly, we know that the Congo River was formed uh, 30, around 30 million years ago, so much earlier, actually, than the speciation event. So it's not the cause of the speciation, but it probably, we 
the current hypothesis is potentially that there was a drought in the Congo River. It corresponds with sort of geographical evidence where a, a sort of founder population may have been able to have crossed the river. We think around here, um, and actually they've gone through a sort of genetic bottleneck and a speciation event may have occurred. That seems to be the closest current hypothesis we have for the jimps and bonobos. So, bonobos, um, I will talk about in the next slide, but I just want to sort of wanted to summarise, uh, as I've alluded to, um, these fascinating species, they're all highly endangered now. Uh, we estimate, for example, that bonobos, there may be only uh, three generations left, um, so that's 75 years. So anyone here is, um, you know, who's got young children or even some of the audience may outlive potentially bonobos, and gorillas are, are certainly probably going to go first with orangutans. Chimpanzees are also in very, very grave danger um, from many threats um, to do with human encroachment, essentially. Um, the consumption of these animals is one of the major threats. Uh, the pet industry, um, there's large exportation, particularly to Southeast Asia, China, um, where they're sort of um, using uh, the illegal pet trade. Uh, there's a lot of deforestation in their habitat. Orangutans are particularly vulnerable to that in palm oil. Um, forest uh, plantations have basically wiped out most of the rainforest in, um, in their habitat in Indonesia and Malaysia. Um, there's many, many great threats. We are their greatest threat. Um, and so the, really the time is now for us to kind of get together and try and um, do a bit more in terms of protecting them and putting pressure on governments to um, protect their landscapes. Um, so now I just wanted to kind of give you some insight into the kind of work I do. So I, I've done a lot of different research over the years, including working in the field. So this is some photographs I took. Um, I've sort of primarily worked with chimpanzees and bonobos over the last 10 years. And I just sort of thought it's always nice to show you a little bit what it's like to be a field worker in the, in the forest. Um, so when we're working in the DRC in the Democratic Republic of Congo, which is where bonobos are found, I'll just go back and see if I can, oh no, let's see if I can just go back one slot, oh, I don't know if that'll work. Uh, let's see. Yeah, so basically I'm going to show you where I work, where I work up here more or less. There's no cities up there. There's just a lot of rainforest. Uh, so you need to basically hire your own private plane to get to most of these places. It's not the cheapest kind of field work you can do. It's possibly not the safest. But it is really, really rewarding. And um, I feel incredibly sort of grateful that I've had this chance to go into this remarkable forest ecosystem up here. Uh, I also work in Kinshasa at a sanctuary, which I will talk about later. So um, let's skip back. So these are just a couple of photos. This is a field site where I've worked. This is our little dot in the rainforest here. So we're somewhere like the here. Um, and this is our plane. We always attract a lot of interest from the local people. Uh, it's one of the big events when you turn up with your little carrier plane here. That's my, um, that's my uh, fellow colleague researchers there. This is the director of the field site who founded this field site in about 2003. Um, so there's a long process of getting the wild great apes used to being followed by humans, um, which uh, basically involves uh, sort of essentially passively following them. We don't have any contact with them. We, we try and maintain distance so that they don't get interrupted or interfered with. They're also very vulnerable to human diseases, so we have to very much maintain that distance um, to ensure that they don't catch any of our uh, nasty diseases. So, oops, I think that just skipped. Uh, Oh, no, there we go. <laughs> Let's see. OK, here we are. So this is uh, me arriving on a canoe uh, to the field site. It's a stunning sort of forest there. It's really pristine habitat. It's protected where I work in a national park. And um, we have these fascinating animals there uh, still, still living there that we, we work to protect and study. Um, so it's a wonderful place to work. It isn't, uh, it's, it's not a lot of creature comforts, and there's a lot of animals living there, so it's a, it's a really nice uh, chance to get back to nature. Um, you see some incredible sort of cases of evolution here. This is just a, one of many examples of an insect that's, that's evolved to basically replicate a leaf. Uh, I, I continually am fascinated by the, the cases of the sort of the insect species that we find there and their amazing cryptic uh, uh, qualities. That's me crossing a, a, a bridge and that's the camp. Uh, that's our little kitchen there. 
uh, very simple, but um, a wonderful place that you can work. We also do have some uh, neighbors that come and turn up at camp sometimes. So, for example, <laughs> this is a, a visitor we had, a, a rather large python, who, um, who turned up at night. Um, sorry for him, though, because uh, that was the end of him. And uh, unfortunately, I, you know, the local people, they, they do eat animals in the rainforest. So the local people immediately um, decided it was in it, we, we actually, unfortunately, didn't want the python to die, but the local people, um, they decided that it was a very, very good opportunity for them to share a big feed. So he was consumed um, uh, for the rest of the week by the Congolese people. Um, but uh, anyway, it's a part of their tradition is to eat animals from the forest. Um, so it's, it's a kind of, yeah, it's an interesting aspect of doing field work. You get confronted with these challenges um, when you're thinking about conservation. So anyway, so that's just an image there. Um, so now getting on to some bonobo research and sort of bonobo information, because I hope the rest of the talk will be really about kind of giving you some insights into chimpanzees and bonobos. Now I've kind of given you some basic um, ideas about them. So I talked a little bit about the idea of self-domestication and just sort of keep that in mind um, when you, and when I think, when you think of self-domestication, uh, the classic case we have is the domestication of the wolf to the dog. So the dogs are a lot friendlier and nicer um, uh, than wolves are in some ways and it's possible that bonobos have gone through this process relating to enhanced female dominance where females have been able to exert greater control over the um, over their choice of mates which could have selected for basically nicer males as a result so bonobos are also very intelligent as chimpanzees are they're very similar in that way uh, suggesting our closest living relative also probably lived in very complex societies to do with fission fusion um, and intriguingly, unlike the chimpanzee, bonobos present to us a really rather different picture of our kind of evolutionary past. Because rather than being characterized through this aggression and this intergroup hostility, what we find is really characterizing bonobo society is peaceful coexistence. So this is a very tolerant great ape species, remarkably tolerant compared to most other species that have been studied, actually. They're a bit of an interesting anomaly, and they are, they are our closest cousins, along with chimps. So I think they pose to us questions about what we could have looked like before we were human. Um, they, they, they operate, um, they, they've been called the hippies of the great ape world, and that they make love and not war. I would say it's a little bit more complex than that, but they do show some of these traits that suggest um, a much more uh, less aggressive and more relaxed social system, which could be related to the fact that actually rather than males dominating society, it's generally females that operate at the top of the hierarchy. Um, females are actually able to dominate males through a, basically a, a very strong friendship network among these females. Uh, particularly fascinating for those that understand sort of primate social systems is actually that um, bonobos, um, intriguingly, um, these are all immigrant females that are actually dominant. So bonobos have what we call um, female dispersal and male, uh, males remain in the natal group, so male philopatry. And that means that actually you would expect males to be the, the closest bonded um, sex because they are, there's closer genetic relationship between them. They're essentially brothers. Bonobos have the same societal structure as chimps do, and we find chimp males have this strong, um, this strong uh, patrilineal society. But actually bonobos, it's the females that depart when they're um, adolescents but it's the females that bond with each other in this society. So females are, uh, are immigrants, they're strangers, they, 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 they uh, appear in new groups and they form these very, very strong social bonds with other females that enable them to dominate males. And to me, this is very intriguing because it also suggests that we have this capacity for really engaging with uh, strangers from other communities and building these strong and powerful relationships. Um, they also have an enduring mother-son bond. So this is really the mummy's boys of the great ape world. Uh, the bonobo sons remain very connected to their mothers throughout their lives. They go through adulthood, hanging out with their mum. Their mum is their best friend. Um, and <laughs> 
the mothers support the sons um, in many different uh, aspects of their daily lives. Uh, we think that mothers benefit from actually promoting the reproductive success of their sons. Um, so there's this inter sort of inter this sort of almost symbiotic relationship you might say between mothers supporting sons and then sons are able to support mothers in, in things like um, alliances. And, and also other females are attracted to those, those sexy sons. So females get benefits too through the, the, the friends that females have with, with the son. Um, they're very emotionally sensitive and I'll talk a little bit about that in, in the next slide. Um, and they also use sexual behavior to regulate social problems. Um, again, something I'll talk about later on. Uh, it's something they're quite well known for. And I'd be happy to answer questions about any of these aspects later. Um, so now I'm just going to walk you through a few aspects of uh, behaviour in these two species um, because they are our two closest living relatives and I sort of think it's relevant to think to yourself, what are we? Are we more chimp? Are we more bonobo? Or are we somehow in between? I'd probably argue where we have both capacities very much in our evolutionary past and our current behaviour. So for example, you've got this big strong alpha male over here. But I think one of you can, you can probably not, without too much difficulty, spot who's the dominant over here. Um, <laughs> there's a powerful uh, alpha female standing here. Her name is Samendra. Uh, I know her very well. I've known her for about 10 years. She's standing there. She doesn't take any rubbish from anyone, as you can see. Um, and these are males sitting here, um, sort of basically sitting and, and hanging out with the females. And, um, and they have this more... Um, peaceful manner of coexisting between the sexes. Whereas with chimpanzees, because of the aggressiveness of males, females tend to sort of remain more in the social shadows comparatively. Um, so we have these sort of interesting different societal patterns in our great ape relatives. Now, also, I sort of alluded to that we have this hunting and cooperation. So male chimpanzees are very good at hunting and cooperating with each other. And we actually know that this is driven by a bonding hormone, uh, oxytocin. I don't know if you've heard of oxytocin before, but it's related to, it's called the love drug. It's a hormone that's released during social bonding. It's actually triggered during um, birth and pregnancy. Um, and actually, interestingly, when chimpanzee males go hunting, we get this, th we find this big surge. Laurent Samuni did this research. Search, she found a large surge in their uh, oxytocin, their bonding hormone, when they're hunting and sharing meat. So it suggests that hunting and cooperation are very important, uh, evolved sort of mechanisms for social bonding in, in other animals as well as humans. And interestingly, uh, a colleague of mine, Adrian Yegi, found very similar patterns in the Chimane hunter-gatherers in Bolivia, which suggests they also get this surge of bonding hormones when they're hunting. And we find that this, this cooperative aspect of meat sharing has got this deep evolutionary past. Now, bonobos also show hunt, um, cooperation and hunting behavior as well. Uh, but as you might have guessed, it's not the males that do it. It's the females. So actually, this picture I took, uh, this is a group of female bonobos sharing an antelope, which they have caught here. And they've gone up a tree. The males are probably sitting down below somewhere, waiting for a scrap to drop. Um, and I just wanted to play a quick video of the females sharing meat. Uh, so you can see this is a group of females and their offspring. Uh, they're sharing the sort of the rest of the kill there. Uh, this is new behaviour. We didn't know that bonobos could do this. Um, we thought that they didn't hunt, but we now know that they do. Um, so it's nice to sort of see this alternative picture of hunting, as because it's an evolved behaviour that people have typically said is male, uh, whereas actually the bonobos are showing us a rather different um, window. Stay to the right, and Susie, okay, older. Okay, that's me. Two babies. Make sure I can I'll identify everyone, which is always hard when they're in the rainforest. And they all look rather all similar when you can just see their back. Um, and we also now that we intriguingly know that they now do this um, with actually outgroup individuals. So we have nice data suggesting that they'll even do this with strangers from other communities. They'll share meat with each other, which is really, really surprising and still makes us question the nature of their relationships with other groups. Uh, it seems to be very, very tolerant in this species. Um, 
So the food sharing is remarkably important for animals, as much as it is for humans, particularly our closest living relatives. Uh, so this is just another video showing. This is not This is actually a veg. This is a large, very large fruit that a group of female bonobos I filmed in DRC are sharing. You can see the tolerant nature of this interaction. It could be aggressive, but actually what you're oh, no, finding here is, is this cooperation between a large shared resource um, there's no need for these animals to actually be aggressing each other. These females have these strong social bonds that enable them to share food tolerantly. Um, and actually, we now know that food sharing is linked again to bonding, both in chimpanzees and in bonobos. This is a study recently uh, showing the physiological basis of food sharing in other animals. Just think how important it is for you to share your meal at Christmas time. Sometimes stressful, there's a few screams sometimes when you're sitting around the Christmas dinner table, but mostly it's, it's motivated by having a, a, a pleasurable social experience. And our ape relatives remind us of the crucial uh, sort of evolutionary past and importance of spending time sharing food, being together in close proximity. It has a really positive effect on your, your own uh, actual fitness and, and health. Uh, we know that the, the individuals with strong social bonds in chimpanzees and bonobos also live longer and have more offspring, uh, and their offspring survive longer. So it really benefits us to be social, uh, as it does with our primate relatives. Um, now, I also wanted to show you a really nice quick video if I have time. Um, this is a, a really nice experiment that was done by a colleague of mine, Shinya Yamamoto, in Japan, which shows actually the extent of cooperation and pro sociality, so that's behaving positively towards others. Uh, this is a, 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 an experimental setup where this guy um, over here, there's an individual over here that actually has two different tools. They, they, they've learned that they need one of two tools to get um, access to a different uh, food dispenser. So there's one rake that they can use to get one type of food, and there's a straw that they can suck to get another, uh, a juice. Now, um, this individual over here um, is actually, he's nothing to do with the dispensation of the food, but it, the, the setup is that this guy gets given the tools, and this guy, on the other hand, actually needs those tools, but doesn't have access to them. So this guy could do nothing, or he could decide to give the other guy some of his tools. Now, interestingly, what you'll find in this video is, if this guy has had this, this is a blocked out window here, if this guy cannot see which tool the other one needs, he actually gives either at random or he doesn't give it at all at all. Whereas if this um, barrier is actually uh, clear and he can actually see the actual need of the other, the specific tool that the other one needs, he will actually give it to him. And I'll just show you a quick video of this experiment to show you the basis of kind of helping each other um, for these chimps. So he's given the tool set. He could just sit there and do nothing, but you'll just see in a moment a little hand popping out. Uh, he's having a good look at the, that's the, that's the, what, the rake, it's actually a walking stick, but uh, he's having a good sniff. Uh, and he's got no food in his side, but you'll suddenly hopefully see in a moment a little hand appearing. Let's see, here it is. So that's the hand. <laughs> he can't actually tell him which one he wants. So he gives him the straw, but he says he doesn't want the straw. He actually wants the, no, is it that one? No. <laughs> so now he's got the right one. So basically, oh, has he? Maybe he's not. This is, I can't remember which condition this is. That's the right tool. Thank you very much. <laughs> So basically what this experiment shows is they are willing to help each other and they are willing to assist others with the goals that are separate to their own. So again, it suggests to us that they're able to understand each other's needs and communicate those uh, in quite complex ways. So another nice example of this is bonobos. Um, bonobos will also pro-socially um, help others in need. So this is a very nice experiment done by colleagues of mine, oops, oh dear, in the DR. Uh, see where we have, oh, sorry, I've got the wrong <coughs> slide there. We have a, one bonobo on one side of a door that can't get into this room, and it's got a lot of food in here. But this bonobo over here has actually learned that he could, if he wanted to, pull a plug, and this door will open. 
He doesn't have to pull it. It's up to him. But what you'll see in this video is actually the bonobo when he... So this guy is behind a door, and this guy's just about to be released into the room with the food. And he has no obligation to do this. You can see this guy is, wants to come in, but he can't because his door is blocked. Okay, number so the four. bonobo comes in. Keep it, Kalina. And he goes straight over. This isn't reinforced behavior. He goes straight over and pulls the, 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 the cog. You can there's a bit of effort full there. And opens the door. And then they both actually go in together. He lets his friend in and they share the food. This is pretty remarkable that he actually opts to actually share. He's very excited. Uh, so they're sharing the food together. So it suggests that they're actually motivated to share and actually help others when they, um, when they can't help themselves. And we know that this is not only for personal benefits. You might say that, well, maybe they got some social benefit from doing that. In the second uh, experiment, this was the helper. He could pull the, um, the, the, this rope to let a banana fall into the room for the other bonobo that needed it. He doesn't even get to touch this individual they're actually separated and um, he still does it uh, and they even do it for individuals that they're not familiar with which is really surprising because it suggests that they show this understanding of the needs of others and will even help others uh, without any obvious benefit to themselves um, it's suggesting that the basis of prosociality has quite a deep evolutionary history in our past so um, I sort of, oh, I wanted to touch briefly on sexual behavior because it's also an interesting aspect of bonobo behavior, uh, which suggests, again, sexuality has a deep evolutionary history uh, as being used as a social behavior in, in animals. This is actually two female bonobos here having a, a very intimate face-to-face -face sexual interaction there. They have a lot of homosexual behavior in bonobo society uh, and they seem to use sex as a social tool to mitigate social tension so bonobos have a rather unique uh, behavior in their sexual their sexuality is used for social functions again something that humans show evidence of um, so I wanted to sort of play you a couple of videos showing the sex sort of importance of social sexual behavior for this great ape species and how it can promote social tolerance. So they use sex as a, as a tool to actually resolve a potential conflict before it happens. So for example, in feeding competition, in the resolution of conflicts, greeting after separation. And in this video I took, this is actually a nice clip of some female bonobos uh, having a potential food competition, but they actually use sexual behavior to resolve that social tension before it happens. So this female's got a very large fruit here and the other one wants to eat it. Uh, she can't, so what the bonobos do is they actually have a sexual encounter. This is a, um, this is, she's still holding on to the fruit, as you can see here, but uh, they have this sexual encounter and it enables them to actually tolerantly share that food afterwards. So after this has happened, you can see the two females sit together. Rather than having a, a fight about it, the sex actually releases that tension, enabling them to be tolerant with each other. Excuse and we me. think that sex is actually functioning in this way um, for bonobos and it seems to underpin some of the more social kind of social and empathic aspects of their behavior they also use it during social uh, sort of reconciliation which I'll quickly play here this is you'll just keep an eye on this video down here there's someone that gets scared and you'll see a very quick social sexual contact it doesn't last long um, but just to give you a sense of how it works <laughs> So that's the conflict. I'll just watch down at the bottom. This is the victim. Oh, I don't know what my, my video is somehow frozen. That's a shame. Um, let's see if I can. Okay. Hopefully it works. I don't know. Maybe the video won't work. Oh, I'm sorry. Basically, he goes and mounts the other bonobo. <laughs> so you'll see two males. I, 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 yeah, I think it's just a bit laggy. But he basically has a, a small, very small mount. He presents actually this male, and then this releases that. It's called a reconciliation. And they use sex to resolve social conflicts. Uh, it's very effective in bonobo society, and it seems to help act as a social glue to um, prevent conflict from escalating. Uh, and that... Oh, I'm going to go round again. Um, let's take a turn it off. 
it might work this time. Oh, no, you got a little bit more, but you didn't get the full thing. Sorry. <laughs> you can see what's going to happen. Um, anyway, and on my final set of slides, I just wanted to bring you briefly up to empathy. Um, because empathy is something that I think is, is, is an important aspect of human behavior. Again, something that we think has a very deep evolutionary history. Uh, empathy is, broadly speaking, the sharing and understanding of others' feelings and their emotions and their thoughts. Uh, we know that empathy, I've sort of talked, alluded to it in this talk, is really, really important to human social interaction. Understanding the needs of others and their, their emotions and their states enables us to connect with others in these really meaningful ways that define us as a species. But the interesting thing about empathy, again, is that although it's special to humans, we, it's probably got a very, very deep evolutionary history. And actually, we can look at that through studying our closest living relatives, the chimpanzees and bonobos. But also, much further back than that, we think it's actually originated when the mammalian uh, lineage evolved uh, as an extension of this maternal care that we find in, mam in mammals, which is actually why some of the really landmark research on empathy has actually been done on prairie voles. Uh, which you might not think of as an empathic species, but they actually s s exhibit many of the behaviours that we even find in, in humans um, to do with sympathy and so on, which I'll present to you in a couple of slides um, just to finish off. So um, we're also interested in, this is some of my research, in how emotions are expressed and how, that, um, how that's evolved and also what um, homologies we can see with non-human great apes. So again, these expressions of emotion which may drive empathy in humans, we find that actually other species produce vocalizations, these are vocalizations, facial expressions, body postures that really seem to have this deep evolutionary homology actually. Going back as far as Darwin, proposed this in his, in his landmark book uh, about the expressions of emotion in, in human and animals. Um, so some of my research is, is about that. And I'll just present a couple of last slides to kind of give you a bit of an insight into what I do. So um, I research, I'll just clip, clip over that. I study this empathy behavior in non-human great apes. And I just wanted to, again, I like illustrating my research with videos because I think it gives you a nice insight into what sympathy and empathy might look like in non-human great apes. Um, so one of the contexts where we study sympathy and empathy is actually um, looking at how uh, individuals respond to distress. So if an individual is upset, what do other animals do in response to someone who basically needs a hug? Well, bonobos um, show a remarkably similar behavior to what we see in humans. And I just wanted to show you a quick clip of that um, here. This is a little victim who's going to be attacked. And you just want to have a quick look at what happens to, um, to her afterwards. Unfortunately, it's a bit sad, that part. But watch this um, guy. He immediately approaches. He offers her that empathic response. She's still kind of upset. She's getting a hug. And there'll be someone that's going to come over in this just a moment um, to actually um, show in, uh, an, an, another individual is going to show her empathy too. So she's having a little hug, hugging it out. Just watch this guy because it's quite interesting what he does. So he's approaching from a distance. He doesn't have to approach her. He's like, it's OK. Don't worry. She's like, oh, no, I'm upset. <laughs> so she's got these two buddies with her. And they sit and show her this, 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 this help that she needs to get over this distressing incident. So we study this in great apes. And I've studied this actually at a sanctuary in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where we have many orphan animals who have been actually victims of the bushmeat trade coming from as a result of the, um, the consumption of the adults. Uh, we have a lot of orphan animals that come to a sanctuary in Kinshasa uh, where they're rescued. And we're actually interested in studying empathy in this population who've actually lost their mothers to see the impact that early trauma can have on this behavior. And actually, um, yes, yeah, so this is just to show you quickly. Uh, very sadly, this is an orphan. They arrive in these very traumatized states. Um, but they go through this process of rehabilitation at the sanctuary. Um, and they have human substitutes who give them that love that they need to um, sort of get over that early trauma. But getting early emotional trauma is hard for animals, as it is for humans. And so we're interested in how that process has shaped this empathy in these individuals. Um, and so what we actually interestingly found is that um, 
when we compared uh, black, you just need to look at black. Black is the likelihood of offering consolation to individuals. You can see that black is relatively low in all of these groups, except for the last group. Oh, sorry, my slideshow is going the wrong way is the ones that have actually had maternal rearing in the sanctuary. So this here is the orphans showing low levels of consolation and empathy, but we're actually finding high levels of empathy and consolation in the bonobos that have actually had true mothers. Um, and it suggests to us that empathy is impacted by early experiences in apes as it is in our own species. And that early maternal bond is very, very important for, for promoting social and empathy empathic behaviours in non-human great apes as it is in humans too. Um, so I just sort of wanted to give you a little insight into that in, um, in great apes um, because I think we find these many similarities in the processes in, in the way that they're developing um, in early life that suggest um, overlap in our evolutionary past. Um, so I will skip this in the interest of time, but we essentially found um, further data that actually this is a, a, a correlation between the empathy offered at the top and your social skills at the bottom, where we find mother-reared individuals are very socially skilled. They also show high levels of empathy, um, which suggests to us this interplay between being social and being emotionally functional in functioning in non-human great apes. Um, and we're doing ongoing research on these orphans uh, at the sanctuary to try and understand the processes that drive empathy um, in other animals um, and to see what similarities we find with our own species. Um, so just to give you a nice closing message, um, these orphans, I said to you, these are individuals that have come in very traumatized states to this, this sanctuary in the DRC. This is Lamella. She arrived in a basically half-dead state uh, in 2004 um, as a result of this hunting pressure from humans. Uh, but she's actually been rehabilitated here, and actually within a few years, she'd actually recovered a lot of her, 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 her health and her emotional functioning. And what's been really fantastic about this sanctuary where I work is actually they do a reintroduction. And Lamela actually in 2009 was reintroduced back into the wild. This is some of the conservation projects that I'm involved with. This is her, actually in 2018, I was there this summer. Uh, I returned to DRC and Lamela coming from this period is now released back into the rainforest. Um, and this is actually her daughter, Mwinda, who is a second generation of orphans that's alive and well in the rainforest. So there's actually, although we have some sad aspects of great ape uh, sort of conservation there are some positive stories and if you want to support the conservation of great apes there is projects like this um, that w where you can actually do your part to contribute to these sort of the protection of these fascinating animals and ensure their protection for the long-term future so I was there in the summer um, and it was amazing to see Lamela because I saw her 10 years ago. S seeing her back in the rainforest is, is such a joy and it makes my work really feel worthwhile. Um, so anyway, I think that's almost the end of my talk. <laughs> so uh, you can support them. Uh, so for example, the Bonobo Sanctuary, Loli Bonobo Sanctuary. We have a charity in the UK called Bonobos UK. You can support directly through there. The Jane Goodall Institute gives you opportunities to do that with chimpanzees. Uh, please do think about um, doing your part in, you can adopt a, a chimp or a bonobo, um, or, 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 or support through other means and education activities. So um, I would encourage you to, um, to, to get, get out there and, and, and learn how you can help um, such our, our, wonderful, our wonderful cousins. Um, and on that note, I would really like to thank you for your attention. I've um, really enjoyed being here tonight, and I'd love to take questions. Um, and I'd very much like to thank many funders, universities. Uh, this is very much a, a collaborative endeavor. I've been supported um, through a number of different grants over the years. Uh, this is my acrobatic bonobo. Uh, I actually do a, a martial arts uh, called capoeira, which actually does this move. Um, we call it the macaco in capoeira in, in Portuguese, and actually, macaco actually means a monkey. So um, it's kind of mad that I saw this female, um, Alikia, her name is, doing this, this movement that I try and emulate. And just to sort of in finish, um, this female bonobo is called Alikia, which does mean hope. 
And um, so that's sort of a note that I like to finish on, um, so we can kind of go forward together and hopefully protect them for the long term. Um, thank you very much. Thank you.